Did you get the sound check yet? I did. Well, you were talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's a pro. Okay. Uh, hello, I hello. am uh, Tatev, uh, here in Rizon DC Tacoma Park location in June of 2021. I have uh, the honor of interviewing uh, Thomas Stanley, who is an author and a musician based uh, in the DMV area. Uh, in the efforts of embracing the beauty and humanity of our memory, we're going to uh, f uh, build the story around your story. Uh, so we'll kind of be begin at the beginning and we'll slowly walk our way to Raison. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, could you please tell me who you are, where you come from, and a little bit about your early life, if you can share. Um, I'll give you just a, you know, a very small um, idea of where, where I, what I've been doing on this planet. Um, yeah. 1959, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I like to brag that I'm as old as the Cuban Revolution. <laughs> I hope I'm as durable. Um, moved here, this area, um, the vanilla suburbs, not Chocolate City, in 1972. Um, reveled in the Watergate scandal and uh, Richard Nixon being run out of office and U.S. troops being run out of Vietnam, a colonial war. Um, I went to Brown University, uh, studied psychology there, met Brother Ah there, uh, was one of his students. Uh, first heard the name Sun Ra there, um, and that brings you up to, um, you know, like the 80s and having kids and working at TPSS Co-op for about 10 years as a collective member, uh, worker owned and managed food cooperative uh, that is still in operation. Um, how, how, do you want me to just be on autopilot here? No, I'll, I'll intervene. Oh, but okay, you'll intervene. Talk, um... I wanted to make sure that we talked about like rhizome in the context of a series of um, emerging and dissolving similar kinds of spaces, yes. you know. Um, I've, I, I've heard a little bit of that story from uh, Lane and from Luke and I will, we will definitely delve into okay. like the story of how Rhizome came into this, but uh, you know, it's, we, we have an hour, hour and a half or oh so, my gosh. so okay. we're so gonna, okay. let's uh, slowly build okay. up to that. Tell me a little bit about, if, if you don't mind I sharing don't mind. again. I don't what was uh, what were you like in school? What was your typical day like? What were you school? Into? Went, which school? Like when college kid. Or, or kid? Like kid, child like childhood? School. I was overweight, asthmatic, bookish, not good at sports, <laughs> um, insecure, huh. um, and kind of overcompensated for my insecurity by being a little loud, mm. uh, maybe more than a little loud. <laughs> um, How were you being loud? Well, loud. Um, you know, you think your jokes are funnier than they are. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you speak when you ought to be listening. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually I learned how to listen, but, you know, it takes a while. It does. Um, I was very um, comfortable with and, and immersed in nature. That, that was always um, my default if I wanted to feel, you know, to find a space of non-alienation was to be on my stomach looking at salamanders or you know pulling apart mud and seeing what was in there, um, poking my nose under rocks. Um, 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 older, um, you know, once I moved to this area, um, and I had a lot of t trouble in school uh, adjusting to everything that young people um, in their teens have trouble adjusting to. But for me, like paradise was, um, you know, smoking and walking in Rock Creek Park was just, you know, that was, that was bliss. Um, what, what year are we talking? What year? We're talking um, 1970, oh, thank you for dating me, um, 1975, <laughs> 76, 77. This is when you first arrived in This is school. after, this is when I finally get to high school and things opened up a little bit for me. Okay. Middle school was hell. Middle school was, um, Daily abuse for my race. Daily abuse. 
Tem in, um... in Cincinnati? Was no, 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 no. After we moved from Cincinnati, where I was quite comfortable in a um, fairly well integrated neighborhood, mm -hmm. never heard the N word. I don't like saying the N word, but yeah. I'm going to respect your film here. I spell it out. But I mean, I You're had never. You're welcome to use and say. I, I just, I just won't. I'll, yeah. I'll concede to yeah. the, uh, to the, to the current prevailing taste. But um, I had never heard the word used against someone in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I had never heard it really used as a, a slur or an insult. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew what it meant. I knew it. Ooh, I knew its implications. But I had never heard it used, you know, one person on another as a way of hurting them. And I walked into the schoolhouse doors as a middle schooler, you know, as a, an eighth grader. Where, where, where was this? This was Leland Junior High School. I don't think it exists anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's Chevy Chase, Maryland. Okay. So. And affluent, you know, I don't, I'm not talking about tobacco farmers and their kids. I'm talking about affluent GS 13s, 14s, um, embassy professionals. Um, very well-to-do, very well-educated people whose children were complete racist assholes. Mm -hmm. And every day um, I had to fight. And I was one of three people of color in the whole school. Oh, wow. You know, there's, um, there's um, the kid from New Guinea who had two first names. And he smoked cigarettes and had a beard, so everybody left him alone. They thought he ate people or something. There was Megumi, who was uh, this Japanese kid that was on every varsity team. So he's like, well, you know, if you play sports, you're in. And then there was, you know, chubby me. And every day it was sport to try to find some new bad thing that you could say about, about me being black. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of fighting at first. Mm -hmm. um, the faculty, the staff at, at Leland Junior High School um, they turned and looked the other way. I had no support, and I was ashamed to tell my parents what I was going through. Oh, wow. Uh, it's okay, it ends well. Yeah, it's okay. Because my political it's transformation, and I think this is what people don't understand about me, is somehow in my head as a kid, mm -hmm. and I had already, in Ohio, I had read Malcolm X, I had read Soul on Ice, I had read the foundational text of the Black Liberation Movement, and my pushback wasn't against white people, the white devil. My pushback was against the white state and the white empire. There's mm -hmm. something fundamentally fucked up mm -hmm. about America and being an American. And I'm, I've, I've never ceased to be skeptical mm -hmm. of that mindset. And I've never for one moment in my entire life felt like an American. Mm -hmm. In my head, according to my understanding of my political reality, I'm a stateless person. Okay. You know, me, the Palestinians, the Kurds, we have something in common. So, um, do you, is this some, when did you come to this uh, realization about yourself? I'm like 13, 14 years old. Wow. Just in, know? in that school. So, check it out. So, I leave junior high. Now I go to this larger group of students that includes a fair amount of African-American students. These African-American students, however, are coming from, um, you know, it's funny, the apartment building that today is called Summit Hills and is a very expensive place to live. Mm -hmm. It was like the projects back then. Wait, where is that? That's on um, the East West Highway at 16th Street, Colesville, 16th Street, right there. And you know, I remember going to parties there and you never knew if it was going to be like a fight, you know, the police would raid parties. It was like the hood. And those kids saw me come in after two years of not being able to be culturally black with other kids. And they were like, you don't really fit in, dude. You don't really have a, a slot. So I made my slot. Um, I don't know how much I should tell on myself. I'm still trying to get tenure. Um, <laughs> But you know, I was I you know like I was fascinated by the culture that surrounded um, cannabis and psychedelics, mm -hmm. and if you could hang in that culture, then kids gave you the nod and was like, well, you know, he gets good grades and he gets high, he's uh -huh. cool, you know. Yeah. So there was a lot of discovery, more reading, Carlos Castaneda, um, various native cultures, um, discovering Rastafari. Mm -hmm. um, this was in high school? This was all in high school. 
You know, I heard a Bob Marley record, Rasamon Vibration, my very, 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 very first reggae record. And I heard him talking about ja. And I thought it was slang for ya, like you, like some slang. I didn't know what he was doing. Ja, ja, ja. Mm -hmm. And the daughter of the Jamaican ambassador rode my school bus. And she was like, oh, you dolt, that's a name for God. Don't you know anything? <laughs> and, you know, so she was kind of like, you know, she was giving me the inside scoop to stuff that I was trying to understand just by listening to records, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you go, and then you go on to college and other doors are opened up. Um, we lost, um, and you'd have to check to tell me whether or not Brother I ever played in Rhizome. But Brother Ah left us um, last year and was just a really st just sterling human spirit. Tell me a little more about that. He taught a non-credit course at Brown University mm -hmm. that I took, I think, in my freshman or sophomore year. And the course was like it met on a Thursday night, no credit, um, in, a, in a building that was called the Third World Center uh, on campus there in Providence. And the, the class was like packed because it was the thing that you could do that was international and multicultural and, and not white. And I, the first time, you know, bro, Brother Ah, whose real, real name, his given name was Robert Northern, Northern uh, played French horn in Sunrise Band during the 60s. So the first mouth that I ever heard the word Sun Ra come out of was Brother Ah. And I didn't know again. I didn't, you know, like I didn't know what Bob Marley was talking about. I heard Sun Ra and I was like, well, what is that? Like a, Jew, a, a blues player? What, what is that? A son? They use Sun a lot down there in those blues names. Maybe that's some blues player. Mm -hmm. I don't know who he's talking about. Sun Ra this, Sun Ra that. You know, so I, I'm collecting records. Um, this is at Brown. This is at Brown. Um, I'm having, again, race wars fought through music where there was this clique of, ch of kids from primarily Long Island um, who would get together. They would trip every weekend. I don't know how you can do LSD every weekend. <laughs> and we would have these fights about um, P-Funk versus the Grateful Dead. And I was sure that I was winning these fights. It was like... You know, it's just, it just sounds like country music. What are you talking about, man? Nothing is as dope as Funkadelic. I'm whooping your ass. You don't know I'm whooping your ass? I'm winning this war. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, you would, we had, this is um, late 70s, and our systems that you could put in a dorm were nothing compared to what people can buy now at Best Buy and like, you know, really have some watts. Mm -hmm. So you take your little tinny thing and turn it up and the cones, the speaker cones are falling apart. And you're blasting your stuff down the hall trying to, you know, get maggot brain to beat trucking again or something like that. I mean, it was just, you know. Um, but I was also kind of alienated in college in as much as I didn't really have like a career, careerist mindset. Yeah, what were you studying in college? I was studying psychology. psychology. I wanted to learn about the mind. I said there's nothing more interesting in like the universe than human consciousness. I'll, I'll get a psychology major and we'll find out about that. And they said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put these electrodes into these animals' brains and we're going to find out which neurons trigger when they see a square. I was like, that's it? That's it? This is the cutting edge of neurophysiology. This is it. This is what's it. like, really? That's it? That's all y'all got? You know, so like three summers of doing this job at, um, and I built up a lot of bad karma, man, um, at NIH, the uh, Institutes on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse. And I saw the same research model. We were working on, uh, we had a bunch of drinking data from uh, the Whitner, Whit, Whitten and Walker um, health center that, that primarily at that time was um, servicing uh, gay men. And we had tons of, of data on drinking behavior and somehow this was going to correlate with animal models that had something to do with drinking. 
And I would, um, I would take animals that have been on various, either a control diet or a diet that had a certain amount of ethanol in it, and I would perform vaginal lavages on these, these rats. It was terrible. And, uh, you know, put the liquid on a slide, and then someone else would actually analyze the slide to see what the quality of the cells on the slide were. And then, of course, the animals, once they had been used once, um, there was a big oven that they went in, and they were incinerated. They weren't good for any other use but that one data point. And by the time I had done that, you know, um, like I worked my way up from penciling in, worked my way up, from penciling in these, um, you know, primitive computers, these, uh, you know, number two pencil things where you have to fill in the dots and I'm taking data from hand-filled surveys and turning it into this. And I worked my way up because I complained about that to abusing these animals that were then, you know, slaughtered um, around the corner from where we ate lunch. And I just was, and because whatever point medically that they were trying to prove, they had already proven, what I saw within the office were people who were making really good careers by just taking the same experiment, changing some absolutely insignificant variable and then going back and re-granting the same experiment and for, to, to, to come up with the same result killing a new round of, of test animals, you know. And I said, this is corrupt, man. I can't do this. I was going to be a, a medical doctor and my mother was like, you know, sure, her heart would like pound outside of her chest as she told everybody that like her son's going to be a doctor. And I was like, no, man, I can't do this. So I wound up, um, I got married. My wife's name is Paula Stanley. And we met while I was finishing Brown and, you know, great, great front end love story um, mm -hmm. that I won't share here. <laughs> and we um, got kind of sick of being in D.C. and had this idea that we'd take this old uh, beat up Chevy that we had called Guido mm -hmm. and we would drive west. And our money ran out like in the middle of the country. <laughs> um, we were staying with her mother who was driving us nuts and we put our coins on the kitchen table and pulled out a map and said, I bet we can get to Madison, Wisconsin. Let's try it. So I went to Madison, Wisconsin and um, I started in a bookstore, um, something called Palm, P-A-L-M, which was the Pan-African Library of Madison, the worst acronym in the history of acronyms, but it was all mine. <laughs> and they let me manage a small encove that had bookshelves. They gave me a little budget, and I would ask for free stuff to just have everything about African struggle, everything about black people and their history and their culture. And it wasn't a lot of titles, but in Madison, Wisconsin, in about 1981-82, it was the best thing going, right? Yeah. And. You know, I was working in a tofu um, plant. You know, one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life was making tofu. You know, get up at five o'clock and, um, you know, grind those beans and cook them. And there was a, this cereal, steamy aroma and atmosphere that just filled the, oh, it's just great. Good job, good for the body, good for yeah. the soul. You know, know that you're feeding people with something healthy. That's yeah. the, so I was repairing the damage I had done to myself at NIH, right? because I was damaged by that crap. So, um, what's cool about Wisconsin is, A, I saw my first Sun Ra concert there. And it, Tell me about that, please. Yeah, it fucked me up. It was a place called Merlin's Nightclub. Mm -hmm. And how, how much did you know about Sun Ra up until this point? Okay. And Paula had presented them at Howard University as part of, like, she was on student government or something. Mm -hmm. um, like, can you imagine, like, the homecoming talent is like, Sun Ra? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so she took me. She was like, oh, you're going to like this. And it was really long, you know. Some bands have this aura, this, this, this legend about doing super long shows, but it's a little bit inflated. I know that I was in there for four hours. You know, I know I was in there for four hours. And the band went through costume changes. Mm -hmm. There was a guy that came out, he had this monster head on, and then he disappeared, and there's people doing cartwheels and flips. 
I came out of there, I said, well, do you like it? I don't know. I don't know what it was. I don't know I what it was. Was it, was it a show? Was it music? Were they for real? Am I okay? <laughs> oh, I was, <laughs> you know. Good question. I came back to D.C. I don't like this part of your interview, by the way. But I'm talking because it's why not get it on tape. Yeah. Um, I came back to D.C. to work with Hodari Ali on Georgia Avenue, across from Blue Nile, mm -hmm. uh, Baba Duku. Uh, that's still on his Georgia, place. Yeah. You know it. Yep. And he and his wife, incidentally, are the people that took Paula to her first sunrise show. So there was some kind of connection there. Hadari Ali ran an African-oriented, pan-Africanist bookstore that was a very um, professional version of the tiny thing that I was trying to do in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Do you remember the name of this bookstore? Pyramid. Pyramid, Pyramid Books. And he distributed on magazine racks in like bodegas and corner stores and wherever he could get his racks, he had a set of magazines that were also culturally and politically oriented towards black struggle. Mm -hmm. And one of my jobs was servicing those magazine racks. So I'd drive around town, get to meet people, talk to people. It was good. Um, um, da -da 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 New Jewel Movement, Maurice Bishop. I met Maurice Bishop about six months before he was assassinated. Um, there was this place called Grenada, boys and girls, and they had a revolution. And Grenada is about the size of Rhizome's parking lot. And the United States, large, secure superpower that they are, sent the motherfucking Marines to crush what they were doing because they were black people trying to do socialism and freedom, and they had to be rolled over. What exactly were they doing? It was called the New Jewel Movement. It was, um, you know, it was people's committees. It was... Uh, grassroots organizing among moms and children. Um, it was, you know, a simple economy based on tourism and nutmeg on a tiny island. Not a lot to work with. How do you build? And Bishop, their uh, prime minister, was just this enormously intelligent, um, charismatic, brilliant man who was destroyed by political intrigue within the New Jewel movement, I'm not gonna get into all the, the details of it, that is, um, by most observers' accounts, undoubtedly uh, facilitated and fueled by CIA intervention. That was the easiest way to tear apart the black liberation movement within the United States, was to create dissent within the Black Panthers while you were also attacking them from outside. And it you know, was easy enough to do with misinformation. Um, so I got really, really like ready to go to Grenada, had saved money, wow. and, and I couldn't believe, like I sat there and watched it on TV, it's like it's so small and there's so many Marines, so many Marines going down here to crush this situation and to reverse this revolution. And um, it hurt me in a way that like, you know, my my political innocence and naivete, uh, you know, I got my cherry popped. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, that's not the way it works. There's no happy ending to this story quite so easily. Um, let's dig in and fight. And I became active within an organization called the Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa. And a lot of people, what they know about it is that this was an organization that advocated um, five states in the Deep South being reassigned to the sovereignty of the new African or black nation. What I found most compelling about Dr. Obadelli's arguments, Imari Obadelli was the uh, president of the Republic of New Africa when I joined. And the only person I've ever known is my president, by the way, not that Kenyan guy, but that was my president. Um, I was his minister of information. He taught that, you know, slavery was horrific, right? We all got that. And we understand that black people were abused physically, sexually, 
Um, every day was traumatic. We understand that. We understand that labor was extracted out of this imprisoned population of kidnap victims. That's who we were. We were kidnapped people. But what we don't get is that the greatest deprivation was that of self-determination. You can't free a people and simultaneously define them as citizens of the same nation that once held them as slaves. And yep. Dr. Obedelli taught us there's an instrument that the international law recognizes called a plebiscite, and we are entitled to one. And I still believe in the 21st century, I am pretty sure that if the vote were held tomorrow, black people would vote to stay in the United States. But I think that that debate that debate would be more, you know, you talk about racial reckoning, would do far more to achieve whatever good objective is implied by those two words than all this other bullshit, all this white guilt and sensitivity training. You know, you make a career, a good career, out of making white people feel bad. And you know, oh, oh gosh, yeah, we're so bad, white privilege. Bullshit. You know, it's bullshit. Yeah. I want a discussion of our colonial status and I want interventions that address our situation as such. I'm in the minority, but I'm correct. I'm an extremist. You know, I already live in a world where there's no war, there's no rape, there's no money, there's no states. I'm trying to get the rest of y'all to join me there. It's a very nice place. Tell me more and when about you're not, well, see, because when you're not, capitalism manipulates us through fear. Capitalism is the political economic aspect of a system which is a way of just controlling time and space. Time and space, it's like a lot. You have to kind of come up with systems to order it. It functions by manipulating us through our fears. Our fear of each other, our fear of getting old, our fear of dying, all of our fears capitalism takes and turns into um, a set of talismans through which they can control us and, and turn us into absolute puppets and slaves. When you are freed from these imposed insecurities, suddenly what you're able to perceive and enjoy in the world, it blossoms. It just blossoms, you know? People see me and they're like, man, that dude, he really, he must, I don't know what he's into, but he must smoke a lot. He must really be like, you know. And it's not. I'm high all the time on every morsel of perception. My duty, my religious duty, is to sacralize every moment of my life. Everything is sacred. The things that culture has defined as, well, this is sacred, okay. But it's all sacred. It's all amazing to me. Yeah. And I just want to pull people into it because it's, it, the more that I'm full with that amazement, I'm not afraid of anything, yeah. you know? And once you're fearless, Fela Anakalapu Kuti said that the secret to life is to have no fear. Strive towards that. Once you get fear out of the way, then it's like, okay, now we can be civilized people. Now we can have justice. Now we can have a world, people talk about the here and now, but social order are, is based on a bunch of projects designed to extend our lives beyond the temporal limits of these mortal packages that they're in. And that's what distorts the whole situation. That's why there's all these statues to tear down. Because everybody wanted, well, this guy is memory. We have to, I don't think we got to remember anybody forever. Let's do this. Let's do this right now. There's so much in this right now. Everybody talks about the here and now. Let's do the here and now. Let's do this. So I've been through all sorts of changes. And we'll go through some more if I've got enough time. But that's, you know, that's what brought me into Rhizome. Yeah. That's what took me out of political organizing and into cultural organizing. I came to the conclusion that the masses of people 
of all the things they lacked to wage a revolution. They had plenty of ingenuity. They had plenty of, of courage, toughness, will, but the imagination, the imagination to paint the picture of the world we really want to live in, that's where we are famished. That's the, the organ that needs development and elaboration upon. And that's why I picked up out of, and people looked at me like, wow, what's he doing? And I went from this extreme political position to let's get behind the art that most challenges the human imagination. And for me, because I already had this connection with, this affinity with, with music, um, that's where I looked first. And I, you know, the hard avant-gardist, people don't like this. I did, I started with free jazz being my universe. But I wasn't talking about a way of playing music, but a way of hearing sound and it was very easy for me. Do you understand? I'm not a genre loyalist. No. It was very easy for me to step beyond free jazz into domains of sound art and noise art and sonic expression that aren't properly to be considered music, yeah. but are very, very, very important to this, this process that I think we're in. And if it's, if it, you know, a catalyst is introduced into a chemical reaction to lower the energy threshold for that reaction to take place. So my work as an artist, our work as an artistic community, is to lower the threshold. That's a beautiful metaphor. To lower the threshold on the amount of energy that it will take for us to birth our new selves, mm. to become the people that we deserve to be. Mm -hmm. Your child, you know, that world. So that's Can you tell me a little bit about how Sandra has shaped your idea of what that world would look like and maybe to tell me a little bit about the book you wrote and where that yeah. was birthed from? Okay. Because um. there is a lot of imagination. Like you said, I've also been, I remember the first show of them I've seen at the French, uh, was it French? French, it? yeah. Yeah, uh, and I remember coming out of there, and I was I was so mesmerized by it. There was so many colors, and there were so many sounds, and they went in the crowd, and then they danced, and they just were being so silly while being playing and like providing this like incredible sonic experience, and being silly and being playful, and like so it was a whole different kind of a thing that I think is so wonderful, and I'm. Bummed out that I haven't known about that for most of my life. So. The most serious project in the world is to recover the innocence and joy of children. And Sun Ra understood that. And Sun Ra created this pageantry of, of light and sound and innocence and play mm -hmm. that um, is an extraordinary being. I don't, you know, if you get me on a Sun Ra thing, we're going to have a problem with your interview. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have a, you only have an hour See, and a half. You Sandra, know? you have uh, two minutes. No, I'm joking. Yeah, <laughs> Just tell, tell, tell me what you can tell me. I think um, he lived a, a vast, productive life while he was here with us on the planet. And then he didn't stop working just because he took off to another planet or wherever the heck he went. And this conceive, if you will, of this vast pyramid that includes all that music, all those recordings, all those performances, all of those um, monologues from the stage, all of the writing that he did, all of the album covers that he designed, all of that enormous productive output, consider it as a pyramid, and the capstone of that pyramid is Alter Destiny. And Alter Destiny, two words, and Sun Ra used it as, as a noun you know, alter destiny, your alter destiny. Alter destiny was a way that Sun Ra found to talk about a positive future, a utopian future. Am I allowed to say that? That's the U word. Um, a utopian future where white supremacy, warfare, poverty, rape, homophobia, genderphobia, all these idiocies 
are just behind us. They're like, you know, those are the dinosaurs of culture. We want them to be fossils. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Yunus, you know who that is? No, I don't. A Bangladeshi man, he invented microcredit, okay. right? The guy that figured out that if you give the husband a, a big loan to build a business, you got a 50-50 chance that he drinks it all up and you don't get anything back on your investment. But if you give the mom a little bit of money so she can buy eggs, she'll figure out how to take those eggs and build a business and she'll have school uniforms for all her kids. She'll make sure that all her kids get their vaccinations. Her, what they found was with these small microloans, you could make huge changes in the lives of women and families living in Bangladesh. So I heard him talking one day about poverty being something that in the future, you'd have to take your kids to a museum to explain to them what it was. And I said, that's the way, that's where we have to get with all this crap. We have to get to a point soon where we have to like explain to our children, okay, there used to be nations. I know this is gonna sound silly, kids. And each one had a little rag that they would wave and it had different colors on it. And this one would wave their rag and that one would wave their rag. And then the two of them would go at each other with sophisticated weapons until one side had destroyed the other. And your kids will say, what? People did that? And we'll say, yeah, but that was the old time. That was the old time. That's before we figured out how beautiful we were. That's before we figured out how beautiful life is. That's before we figured out that justice is like the technology. That's the technology. We don't even know what justice is. You know, like trying to, you know, the, the expression trying to explain a car trick to a poodle. We don't know what justice is. Oh, hey, that cop, he's going to jail for murdering that black man. That's not justice. That man is still dead. You can put the cop in jail. You can cut his nuts off. Whatever you do, that doesn't create justice. What creates justice? Justice is, is um, a deeply rooted commitment. And I think this commitment is not effort. It's a collapse. It's an easy thing to arrive at. The, 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 recognition of mutual ontological necessity. I can't obviate your existence for my convenience. That's easy to say if you're a human being, but I would ask that like before you go to squash the next bug, you ask yourself how necessary that murder is. Ask yourself. I'm not saying you don't, I'm not saying I don't ever kill a bug. I like bugs. I like them too. I don't kill them. I let no. them be. I bring them outside if they bother my guests. Everything has its own validity to be, and we have wrecked the planet, wrecked literally the thing we're riding on, the thing that everyone shares, we've wrecked it through a concept of dominion, through a concept that says, somebody's religion, ugh, somebody's religion says that God said, hey, you see all this shit around you? It's nice, ain't it? It's all yours. Go at it. Really, Lord? Yup, you got dominion. What does dominion mean? Dominion is absolute and total control. Metaphor. Your friend loans you a Mercedes Benz. Nice car. One of those, I don't know like Mercedes Benzes, but that's an icon for expensive mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> and you put a bumper sticker on it. And your friend is like, I lent you the car. Yes, I'm down with BLM, but I didn't tell you to put that on my bumper. He's livid. Your friend gives you the car. You're the owner of the car. Now you have dominion over the car. You can chop the car into a million pieces and, and, and throw all the pieces into separate corners of the world. You have dominion over it. There's nothing your friend can say to you now about how you've treated that car. Well, that's to me what the monotheists are saying with this idea of dominion, that the Lord gave it all to you. Whoever the Lord's talking to can look out at everything else as something to consume, to use, to sell, to take. And that includes other human beings if you don't think the Lord was talking to them. That's what happened to my people. Hmm. They look like men, but 
They don't have Christianity. Let's take them. We can get a lot of work out of them. A lot of work and a lot of sex out of them. Let's take them. You know, never forget that sex, that slavery was an institution. And nobody likes to talk about this. We, the descendants of the victims, and they, the descendants of the masters, nobody wants to talk about the fact that picking cotton was hardly the most degrading thing that we were asked to do. We were owned in every sense that a human being can be owned. And they had dominion over us. Do you understand? Mm. So, you know, for me, my work here, and boy, I mean, I want to talk about Rise Home because I just came to say like great things. We're going to do that next, yeah, don't you? You know, worry. what has happened here and, and, you know, just how beautiful it's been. So do anyhow. you want to change the lens? Yeah. yeah. Let's do that and we can switch. There, and you're, they're set up and you can tell like, well, they ought to be playing music and you see Ian doing this and this and he's looking, he's looking. Okay, cool. And he's like, I, I, I don't have any drumsticks, right? The drummer. And, um, but he had brushes. So they did the whole set on brushes and it just gave it a very, um, if you can imagine like the waves are behind you and the band with all the percussion being played with brushes in front of you, it was just beautiful. It was That's just so really wonderful. beautiful. Mm. Mm. So do that stuff, open air by the ocean. Yeah, man. And dream. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, open air is really like a dream for me. So that Rhizome, whatever next happens, will have an outside space because I think this is so wonderful. Okay. But uh, tell me a little bit, so tell me about how you first encountered Rhizome. How, what brought you here? Oh, okay. I know you're connected to the larger community. So feel free to like touch on that too. You know, I, I tried to prepare mm -hmm. for this interview by seeing how many first I could dredge up, you know, how many memories I could dredge up and, and definitively say, yes, that was the first time I heard this, that was the first time I did that, first time, and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't pinpoint, um, you know, when was the first time that I walked in here? What was the first thing that I saw? I couldn't pinpoint any of that stuff. What I do know is that I started coming here as um, Luke's work at Union Arts was shutting down. Yeah. Um, going through a very similar thing where, you know, there just aren't enough um, expensive places for people to live in this area. And so um, all of the cool places to make art have to be moved out of the way for condominiums and uh, luxury hotels. They're saying hotels. low income for this place. Low income out of those people's mouths means like, exactly. yeah, if I ever get to be middle class, I'll be able to afford your your low-income uh, housing. But let's, let's see, maybe someday I'll live where Ryzen was. Ha, ha, ha. But I do remember, I, 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 you know, I had like bullet points in my head. Mm -hmm. And Rhizome is a listener's room. I agree. Rhizome is a place where um, the intimacy between not just the performer as a social entity, but the performer as a sound organizer as a sounding entity is 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 maximized that that distance is minimized and the intimacy is maximized there was a decision made um, you know pyramid atlantic mm -hmm. was another performance space that was used a lot by um, this same community of um, you know rogues and avant-garde mm -hmm. people and Sonic Circuits, Jeff yep. Sirax and uh, my man Pat Gillis, um, they lost their space and somehow Rhizome came into possession, I believe, of their sound system, which was a nice chunky, you know, it's downstairs or outside, I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, nice chunky, um, loud but clear system with good bass amplification, you know, a subwoofer that when you needed that extra bit of bottom, you had it. And um, I just was immediately blown away by what it felt like to witness music here. Mm -hmm. What it felt like to, um, to bathe in the waves and to, um, ah, I, it, it just was so special to hear here. You know, there was a way of receiving that happened downstairs. Yes. 
that just was just you know uh, unprecedented. Yes. Right, exactly. Unprecedented. And you know, there's a there's a succession of similar types of projects. I mentioned Pyramid Atlantic, Union Arts. I know people have talked about Sangha, Jennifer Carter's work. Um, I believe she had three different addresses, all of them, I don't want to say within walking distance, one of them I could literally hit with a rock if I had a good arm, right across from the CVS wow. over here, you know? And she, um, I'm a founding member of the original group of people that did Transparent Productions. We came together in 1997 at Food for Thought, DuPont Circle, mm -hmm. and um, very quickly, this larger group went down to five people. It was Herb Taylor, Vince Cargaldis, Larry Applebaum was the person that organized the whole thing, mm -hmm. Bobby Hill and myself. And Larry's original idea, and it was a beautiful idea and it worked well, and that's why we called ourselves Transparent, was to create a situation, since we weren't concert promoters, where all of the funds, all of the door, went directly to the artist. No paid venues, no frills, no transportation, no hotel rooms. The transparent model that we worked under for many, many, many years, many years, was just that. And it was Larry Applebaum's idea to, um, to keep it like that. And a lot of those, um, really seminal, um, Frank Lowe and Matt Shipp. I mean, a lot of those concerts happened um, at Jennifer Carter's various locations. So I came into here, into here, into Rhizome, um, recognizing it as part of this lineage of pop-up or improvised or DIY performance venues but I also was aware walking in the door that there was something um, expanded and enhanced and um, something larger about how Rhizome was getting this similar work done. Um, the gallery upstairs, um, which sometimes kind of served as your green room if you were a performer, um, the art was always shifting around and changing and I've seen I mean, so many things that I can't remember well enough to articulate that just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And it was always something different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the, um, the fact that the, uh, in the warm months, the, the back area uh, turns into this, you know, very informal lounge and people um, self-associate and find, you know, the table they want to sit at. Um, I-71 happens and people get really liberal about their cannabis use. <laughs> um, and, and it just, uh, it just like, just, you know, um, as an audience member, I haven't even talked about performing here. Mm -hmm. uh, it just was just a series of the mesthetics I heard here, just, yeah. psh, um, this house irreversible. Has lived the life. Oh my goodness, that room, what it's heard? Irreversible entanglements. Yeah. Um, David Murray. Oh, just some sound. And um, you know. Tell um, me about your experience experience of performing and how was that relationship between the performer and an audience built? If or well, blurred. There were some things that didn't come together for me as an artist until I played here. Um, there are shows that I did at some of the other venues that I mentioned that, you know, I don't, I don't know that they're particularly memorable or that I did that well. Something about rhizome fit the way that I hear and the way that I choose to produce sound in a way that allowed me to develop, I needed development and to develop rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, I created for myself sometimes by just being persistent, 
performance opportunities, um, opportunities to collaborate, and it just, um, you know, I got a thing where I can't play well, well until I take off my shoes. And I have my shoes off downstairs so much, you know. And sometimes, you know, you go in thinking it was going to be about a show and some sound. And you get into a thing where you're in, you know, this communicative mode with words with the audience and you want to talk to them. And they would let you talk. And without being rude about it, they'd let you know when, okay, thanks, Thomas, and now let's move on into the music. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. We needed it, but now, you know, let's move, okay. Um, it's that kind of a listening room. There's so many people, including yourself, that I've met here, but I can't remember what that first meeting was. I, I just, I would be, you know, I'd be lying to you to say, oh. And I mean, many people like that. Yeah. I can't buy there. Nick it's Francis, who I played with, um, my first show coming out of the, the pandemic was outside here mm -hmm. with the percussionist drummer uh, Nicholas Francis. Well, I know I met Nick in the audience first, but I can't remember when it was or what show it was at. And you, you only know what people allow you to know about them, but because I think Rhizome always had such a progressive I want to say abolitionist stance in how it projected its objectives, its values. Um, you, you, you always felt like the people that were here to hear you, the people that were here to play with you, you know, you didn't have any fascists. You didn't have any, um, you know, people walking around with, uh, you know, these reactionary, um, we all have reaction that has to be purged, but I mean, I'm talking about people that are committed to it committed to their reactionary tendencies, enshrined them behind various false ideologies of you know, various kinds. Um, so that comfort level of feeling like, well, if nothing else, I'm in a group of people that are on my side in this larger battle of justice versus injustice. And that makes a big difference when your music isn't about making money, your music mm -hmm. isn't about um, demonstrating how clever you are. Your music is about stimulating people and keeping them unsettled enough to make large and grand changes in the world in which they live. I mean, that's really what it's for. It is a form of activism. It is a form of, you know, very peculiar form of inner resistance. Yes. We must make ourselves in here completely unsuitable to live out there and you say to yourself, well, why would you want to do that? That sounds really uncomfortable. Because the struggle to get, you know, I'm not going to change this. I'm going to change that. And that is the struggle that defines value, virtue, morality, change, the positive direction. You know, go yeah. forward. Don't go backward. Look backward. But keep your eyes this way if that's where you're going. Yeah. You know. What are some of your hopes for Rhizome's future? What are some things that well, perhaps we could change also? Rhizome's not a building, it's a collective of people. What keeps it together? I don't know. I mean, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a person that benefits, and I, I'm going to name names knowing that I'm excluding people that I probably shouldn't exclude, but the people that I remember helping me, you know, finding uh, adapters for me and pulling mic stands out for me and adjusting this for me and how does this work and why can't I hear my those people uh, Steve Tom Mike uh, Lane and you know a half dozen other people that you know I forgive me um, I assume that some nucleus will go forward to do something similar but it's not necessarily the case that it'll be anything like this yeah I don't know how it could be and that's okay you know, but I hope that there's some commitment to um, putting energy, you know, that good energy, that experience, that knowledge about how to get this to work into accomplishing the things that were accomplished here, of bringing people together around, um, you know, living art, art that is living, that is coming out of people's lived experience of their lives, not their 
you know, their wallet, their bank account, their careerist objectives, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's beautiful to, to receive something that capitalism didn't make is so unusual that when people give you an opportunity to receive something of value that your capitalism didn't make that, it's great. You know, it's great. That's a gift. That's a service to, to everybody. So I wish everyone well who identifies as Rhizome and, you know, send me an email. I'll be there. You know, I'll be there. I'll be there in whatever capacity that I can, mm -hmm. you know. And with, uh, you know, with this pandemic and the fact that we, a lot of us have done a lot of this kind of gatherings outside and kind of a little bit, you know, lately, uh, this brings up to me the idea of openness and Rhizome from uh, my perspective and from many others I've heard feels safe to be here. It feels like a oh, second totally. home. Mm -hmm. So I just want, uh, as like a last prompt from me, uh, if you can reflect on uh, how you you would see safe and open spaces developing in the future, what what makes them so for yourself and well, how, what your wishes are. There's a tragedy in seeing the same thing happen um, more than once. Yes. Uh, you know, union arts, um, was beautiful. It was disgusting to see Luke evacuate that space. And as far as I know, they still haven't torn it down. They still haven't started constructing the thing that was to replace it. Seven years ago. So, so like shit, we could still be having shows there, you know? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So until ownership is obviated and we transcend beyond it, um, I would hope that the next rhizome is a space where capitalism can't move you off the, the land. You know, capitalism can't say, okay, nice run, kids. Get out of here. We need some more condos. Low income housing or whatever kind of housing. Uh, I'm going to apply. I'll tell you how low income it is. Um, it's, it's a I, your, your thing for openness, mm -hmm. I want to speak frankly to that. Yes, please. So I just did the thing outdoors mm -hmm. with uh, Nick Francis. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I really loved playing with him. It was great. It went really well. Um, I have always, as a person that produces and promotes concerts, and as a person that plays in concerts, playing outdoors sounds like such a good idea until Mother Nature says, nah. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. Not today, kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so in the tropical <clears throat> sea summer. So I see maybe some like giant um, gazebo-like structure that accomplishes your openness to nature and yet um, uh, takes into consideration the fact that sometimes it's nice to have a roof. Absolutely. And, and, you you know, don't want the cancellation. Yeah, you got your electronic instruments, you know, until we get off the grid, you know, <laughs> we're still, still playing with electrons and, you know, you don't go with rain too well, you know, mm -hmm. storms, hail, that kind of thing, not good. But, you know, openness even besides like that uh, literal one, just like open. And Do you know what the problem is? Yeah. Get successful, meaning, meaning getting enough of that structural, institutional thing that you can keep capitalism from brushing you off the map. It's a double-edged sword because now it opens you up to gentrification. Yeah. It opens you up to who's playing at Rizo? Really? Oh, they got all sorts of places to play. Why are they playing at Rizo? They ought to be at Blues Alley. That's go go take, take that shit to Blues Alley. They love that shit there. Why is that at Rizo? That's on us to make sure that the voices that aren't being heard elsewhere are heard in our space, whatever we create, you know, because those voices, like you're saying, there are other venues, larger. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. You know, it's real tricky. You know, there's this line at which um, you know, it just, it goes very quickly from being, you know, something cool and underground to, you know, flip. And yeah. now, you know, and now the Kennedy Center is doing their loft scene or, you know, this big institution is trying to emulate your vibe. And, you know, and I think part of it is like, just be, um, you know, I, I excel at being just in your face subversive. You know, the ground on which you're standing belongs to the Indians. Give it back. Give it back now. That guy's an Indian. Give him that on, right now. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, 
like if you take that kind of posture, then like the establishment people, they kind of cross the street. Now you lose a lot of money like that. I know. Yeah. But do you need it? Yeah. You know, look at how much was done here on a shoestring budget. Yeah. And how much joy, you know. Yeah. This place is and like home for would... so many people. It was home, yeah. man. You know? Yeah. yeah. And like it sounds sort of functions on its own in very strange ways, like with so few regulated things. We kind of like all take care of it because it's like ours. Like creating that, I think. There are potentials folded within the human body mm. that we can only recognize by unfolding them and putting them into action. And we'll see what's possible. And I have tremendous faith in the energy that made this happen, mm -hmm. um, catalyzing something that is equally wonderful, equally useful, and equally um, supportive of the cause of just moving forward into justice. Yeah. Justice is like, you know, like, like it's, uh, some 150, couple of hundred thousand years ago, somebody figured out how to control and share fire. Mm -hmm. And it changed everything. When we actually have justice, we're gonna be like, oh my God, this is the technology. We were playing around with like microchips and all that stuff. Justice is the shit. Justice is amazing. I don't lock my doors. I go out at night whenever I want to. I, you know, I don't fear for my children. I don't, you know, justice is the shit. That's what we deserve, justice. You don't know anything about justice. Nobody has figured it out yet. Nobody has brought it, you know, like cold fusion or something. Somebody's in the laboratory working on it, but they don't, they don't even have a prototype for you yet. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't capitulate to the state. Um, Aaron Martin, um, I'm paraphrasing and probably messing it up. He would end all of his shows by saying, don't be a uh, white supremacist. Don't be an imperialist. Don't be a fascist. I probably messed it up he there. He says uh, to be an anti-imperialist, uh, anti-capitalist, and anti rights -erasist. There you go. There you go. Luke said that earlier today. Good, good, good. Well, <laughs> that Luke, is, he actually ended it on this note, and you're ending it on this note. Luke would know. That's, that's Last time I heard Aaron play, it was downstairs, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. I, I hope he rests in power. Yeah, he's waiting for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. I think Thank I'm you, good. Tatev. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, wonderful. I we, hope I wasn't terrible. Yeah, you were wonderful. Okay, I think I'll get we you had a, a, a book. I'll bring books with me yes. next week. And yes. take, take one to our media with you. And yes, I will. Just bring, bring me one and oh. I will, because I can't travel with too much. I already, I'm already, oh, I so this that. is I Rhizome that, I, I drew that one, so it, that's also. Oh, thank you. Well, your shirt looks way better than mine. I don't, it might be a little big, but that's the only thing.